So, Neanderthal wasn't such a loser. He had his little campfire, his Davy Crockett outfit, using his tools. Uh, <clears throat> Check out these genuine Stone Age rocks from my personal collection over there. These are just like the ones that Rocco used. Oh, Rocco was making tools. Well, what kind of tools are those? These? Oh, these are, um, paperweights. Paperweights? Well, then you didn't exactly make anything, then. Yes, I did. I made a mess with my papers, and I used these to hold them down. We pick up the trail of the Neanderthal here with Nick Barton. He's kind of a time-traveling handyman. This rocky cove is his workshop. He learned how to make his own Stone Age tools by studying the ones Rocco left behind. Here are some examples of his handiwork. These stones might not look like much, but 100,000 years ago, they were cutting-edge technology. Here are a couple of hammer stones that I will use in order to break into the flint, which is a very sharp stone. It's sharper than the sharpest steel. OK, now, this would actually provide a suitable flake on which to make a tool, a scraper in this case. One uses a number of hammers here of limestone in order to remove tiny chips from the edge of this flake. Now, pay attention here, Sam. This is the correct way to use a hammer stone. Nick would have made an awesome Neander dude. That edge is going to be great for scraping. Right, well, this is the scraping edge now. These sorts of tools we think we use for processing or working hides. For example, like the piece of leather which is on my thigh, could be scraped in order to remove the fat and the grease from this piece of animal skin. Those were some impressive tools, Detective. Too bad you couldn't make a beard comb. Rocco's too busy to worry about stuff in his beard. He's trying to find another link between him and us. Well, he should see these x-rays. These are some of the bones found at Crepina. You can see that their arms and legs were broken. And this was a long time before casts were invented. Neanderthals had it tough. At age 40, they were already senior citizens. And most of them didn't even live that long. And when they died, some of them were given prehistoric funerals. In a cave in Iran, a skeleton was found that shows us how the cavemen buried their dead. He was about 40 and was blind in one eye. For years, he could hardly walk, but someone had taken care of him. And when he died, they said goodbye the same way that we do today. From the fossilized pollen that was found around him, we can tell that his family had put flowers on his grave. That's kind of touching, don't you think? Yeah. You know, from everything we've seen, I'd be proud to be descended from the Neanderthals. Me too, Sam. But just because we feel that way, it doesn't mean everyone else agrees. Even though Rocco's kin showed signs of acting like us, were they really our ancestors? Or were we descended from some new kids on the block? I'm talking about a new kind of caveman coming to town. And it looks like Rocco knows something's up, too. 60,000 years ago, Rocco spent his nights around the fire, perfecting his stone tools. The same way Sam does today. But life was about to get complicated. Detective Rocco and the other Neanderthals were going to have to share their world. Here, check it out. The newcomers look different than the Neanderthals. They had better haircuts, too. Based on their bone structure, anthropologists can see that they were taller and thinner, and their noses were narrower. But they didn't just look different. They had more advanced tools, and they invented something the Neanderthals had never thought of. They created art. Their cave paintings are still on display today. No one knows exactly what these paintings mean, but this was evidence of a new, more advanced kind of thinking. Check this out. They made sculptures of their supermodels, too. This sculpture's even better. Look at the detail. It almost looks like a real skull. Uh, Sam, that is a real skull. There. What did I tell you? So it looks like Neanderthal Man has got some company now. Yeah, a new kind of caveman hit town. Hey, maybe they could turn the Neanderthals onto the art scene. Well, it was one of the most important social events in the history of human development, but nobody knows exactly what happened. Must have been a pretty good party, though. You know, the new guys might have painted a picture on the wall, and the Neanderthals broke out the paperweights. But to try and get a better idea of what may have happened when these guys met up, we have to go back over five million years, all the way to Africa. 
This is where an ape-like creature stretched its legs and took the first step to human evolution. Then, after a few more million years of development, Homo erectus stood up to be counted. His descendants left Africa and migrated north to Europe, eventually developing into Neanderthals. The more advanced artistic cavemen came later, but for a while they were probably neighbors here. This is Gorham's cave in Gibraltar. It's at the very southern tip of Spain, but Africa is only a few miles away, just across the water. Paleo detective Chris Stringer is bravely tiptoeing down these rickety stairs with his team of boneheads. He's trying to find out what happened at this early meeting of the mines. Modern humans had uh, a, a much more complex social system, and art was part of that more complex social system, complex way of adapting. I think modern humans were able to look ahead and look back over long time distances. I think the Neanderthals lived mainly for the present. Modern humans look back into the past through mythology and stories and traditions, and they look forward also far into the future. They were able to plan ahead uh, for, for long periods of time, uh, for years ahead sometimes. This site of Gorham's Cave has uh, a fantastic record of, of most of the last 100,000 years in these sediments. And there's a lot of evidence of Neanderthal occupation of this site, and also occupation by early modern people. Can we pick up the changeover in behaviour between Neanderthals and modern humans? And can we indeed find some more fossils that will help to document this period of uh, coexistence? This skull is from one of the cave painters. And when Chris looks at it, he sees a connection between Old Baldy and us. The overall pattern of the skull is a modern one. We've got a fairly high forehead. We've got a rounded skull. It's rather high. Um, we've got a face which is broad and flat. And again, that is a face that we find in early modern humans all over the world. So Stringer's saying we came straight from the cave painters. Yeah, but that's just one theory. And if there's one thing we know about the boneheads, they like to have lots of theories. Or, in this case, two. One side thinks that after Neanderthals evolved from Homo erectus, they kept right on evolving. Eventually, mixing with the cave painters and becoming Homo sapiens, which is you and me. But the other theory says that when the new, more advanced kind of humans showed up from Africa, the Neanderthals were pretty much left in the dust. It was during the Ice Age that these two groups finally met. The Neanderthals were on their home turf, and they'd been there for two or three hundred thousand years. But when the cave painters got there, Chris thinks the Neander days were numbered. I see no reason to assume that the Neanderthals never had any contact with these newcomers. There could well have been contact. There could have been exchange in some areas. There could even have been interbreeding. But essentially, this led to the demise of the Neanderthals. They had been evolving in Europe for two or three hundred thousand years, and the arrival of these newcomers was really the, uh, the beginning of their end. But Detective Milford is back in the lab, and he's breaking out the magnifying glass to take a closer look at the evidence. He sees the story of Neanderthal a whole lot differently. Milford has been studying these fossils for about 20 years. But his assistant Slim is still the only one who has a key to the uh, skull locker. Security is tight, but Milford's seen enough evidence to say that Neanderthal might have had what it took to go modern, all on his own. Milford found even more clues to support his theory here, in a cave north of Krapina. The fossils they found here include some of the most evolved Neanderthals of them all. Based on these bones, Detective Milford deduced that Neanderthal man was in some way a link between the Flintstones and the Jetsons. Milford thinks the Neanderthals kept interbreeding with other cave people. Their children look like a combination of both parents. It's just the same as today, when people from different countries marry each other. And their children look like a combination of both parents. Milford calls this gene flow. And he says it's thanks to gene flow that we are who we are today. The evidence, as I understand it, shows that different features that we have, different modern successful features, appeared in different places. And they spread widely because populations were always interconnected, just as we see in Western Asia, where there's interbreeding between different folk. So that perhaps we have in South Africa, brow ridges disappear quickly. Perhaps in North Asia, crania become thin. Perhaps in Europe, crania become large. These all intersect with each other, these ripples where the features come together. It's the ripples that make us modern. There goes my man Milford, making waves in the gene pool. Well, if he's right, then we're all one big happy family, Neanderthals included.